With stress, mitochondria have receptors for cortisol, the stress hormone, and that will do good things to mitochondria, help them produce more ATP. They will thrive in small amounts of um, stress. But when it's chronic, they will then start just like simple carbohydrates. They will be pushed beyond what they can do. They will become dysfunctional. They will break down. They will drive inflammation and uh, trigger an immune response, which will then be harmful to the hippocampus. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you or your loved ones suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, stress, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health experts from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal over the long term. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. So we've got Ray Griffith here for Mind Health 360, and I'm very grateful for you to come and speak to us about mitochondria and mental health, which is a very, very interesting topic. And Ray Griffiths is a registered nutritionist and lecturer and has been researching and practicing nutritional therapy for over 20 years. Ray's MSc dissertation was on the role that mitochondria play in Parkinson's disease. His lectures and webinars have covered diverse subjects such as cancer and nutrition, depression, chronic fatigue, cardiovascular health, neurodegeneration, MS, and aging. He's the author of three books, Depression, The Mind, Body, Diet, and Lifestyle Connection, which is this one, which is very, very good. Mitochondria and Health and Disease, which is a teaching book and which is quite dense, but it's also very, very interesting and brilliant. And Parkinson's Disease, an in-depth metabolic guide. Ray is a lecturer at the College of Naturopathic Medicine in the UK. And I'm very grateful to you for coming here because I think mitochondria are a very uh, often misunderstood, slightly unknown quantity when it comes especially to mental health. And so I'd love you to start by telling us, because I know how important they are to mental health and especially to things like depression, anxiety, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, neurodegeneration, etc. So if you could just tell us a little bit about what mitochondria are and what they do, and and then obviously how they impact mental health. Yeah, um, mitochondria, thank you for inviting me, by the way. The mitochondria, uh, they used to be bacteria. So a billion and a half years ago, these bacteria called alpha proteobacteria. And there was this process, and it's quite a magical process, really, where these bacteria, uh, through endosymbiosis, as it's called, they, they symbiotically combined with an organism called archaea. And it was a just a brilliant combination. This this combination of these two organisms joined together allowed one to have a host, a safe host, and the other one to then have energy and aerobic energy as well, to have oxygen utilizing organisms to give energy and help these organisms that were anaerobic to become aerobic. So they could this this organism was a wonderful unit, and it's the building block for all of our cells. It's called uh, a eukaryotic cell. It's a massive quantum leap in evolution. I don't think we realize just how important that was for all of us to exist. So mitochondria being bacteria, they, they're they great when they're giving us energy, but they can be quite dangerous too. So they're, they're, they're a mix. They're a mix between helping us get plenty of energy and if they're upset, if they're damaged in some way, then they can cause problems. And we see this in, in mental health, that mitochondria that give us energy start to break down. And then when they break down, they start to release their components and they're remembered by the immune system uh, as bacteria. So we, we see that in mental health issues and particularly suicide risk. There's much more uh, breakdown products of mitochondria in people that risk of suicide so that that's that's an interesting thing so these people have been under intense stress and it's led to this uh, breakdown of their mitochondria in terms of mitochondria in the brain so we it, our brain is probably a master class in evolution it is one of the most evolved if not the most evolved thing on the planet it 
it's astounding. If you joined all our neurons end to end, they would reach the moon and back and back to the moon again. Wow. So one person's neurons, the distance that we have and we have to get energy and nutrients up and down and mitochondria have to travel up and down that distance. So we, in some neurons, there's about 2 million mitochondria in, in those neurons. Uh, some is a lot less, but they have to travel up and down and they have to be able to produce energy. They need to make energy, at the synaptic connections in our brain. They need to build synaptic connections. So they do this amazing job of giving energy and rebuilding the brain. And the, the brain is continually being rebuilt all the time. We have to, so we need energy to be able to recreate an inner landscape in our brain that models the outer world. And this is another problem with depression. If you haven't got sufficient energy to remodel and remap your brain, rewire your brain so it mirrors what's going on around you, then you feel quite detached from the outer world. You, you need to be able to change your neural connections so that whatever's happening to you is mirrored and you, you've adapted to the outer world. And so it's going to be very difficult if, if you don't have the nutrients to keep that brain remapped. And we see in, in depression that people have mitochondrial dysfunction, they have inflammation, they have the inability to rebuild parts of the brain. So it's quite exciting as we understand mitochondria more and how they impact on mental health, how they impact on the evolution of the brain. Another example, uh, our hippocampus is, is incredibly involved in, in depression. It tends, it tends to shrink. Hence so, why you've got yeah, the hippocampus yeah. so, on, the, on so the book. The, the hippocampus is, is a seahorse-shaped part of the brain that's heavily involved in depression. And the reason it's on the cover of my book is that it shrinks during depression and it's called atrophy. And if we can help encourage this part of the brain to regrow, because it's one of the few parts of the brain that can regrow itself oh. through neurogenesis. It's called neurogenesis, it can regrow itself. So many of the things that are in a healthy diet and lifestyle are brilliant at regrowing this hippocampus and helping us defend ourselves from depression or, or trying to recover from depression. And what's, so that's fascinating. I mean, you've given us already a lot of information. What's the relationship then? I mean, so you said that certain neurons, which are the brain cells, have 2 million mitochondria inside them and others have fewer. And you've also said that the mitochondria have to move up and down. Do you mean the axons? Yes, they do. Yeah. They. So they go to the end of the synapses and back. Is that how it works? Or Yeah, there's, there's, there's a certain percentage of mitochondria which are mobile or motile, I think is the, the correct scientific term. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain mitochondria which are, they, they, they're quite homely. They like to stay in one place. Mm -hmm. So there's, And some might change between the two. But the ones that are, are motile, they will travel up and down the axons and they're, they're on a roadway. Uh, and they're necessary to rebuild neurons or to power neurons. Is that is that how it works? Like, how does the actual mechanism of, you know, neuronal mitochondria? How do they provide the brain with the energy? Do they, you know, and how do they contribute to neurogenesis? And what's their relationship, for instance, with you know neurotrophins like B and B, B um, yeah, brain, BNF, yeah. brain drive, brain neurotrophic, drive neurotrophic factor, factor yeah. and nerve growth factor, you yeah, know, NGF. So, what is the relationship between these different neurotrophins and the mitochondria? Yeah, it's a complicated relationship, so I try not to jump around too much. So, so starting off with mitochondria they're producing something called adenosine, adenosine triphosphate. That's ATP. That, that, ATP. That's the energy currency. That's what we need to provide energy. And this energy can provide help provide all the necessary energy for the raw materials to build synapses, so the phospholipids for the synaptic growth. They, everything needs to, the DNA needs to be powered, all the genes need to be powered. It's a, it's a hugely hungry, energy hungry system. And I, referring to a guy called Nick Lane from University College London, he, he worked out that these individual mitochondria or mitochondrion across their membranes, they have the equivalent energy size for size, because if you imagine they're microscopic, these mitochondria size for size, 
the energy across those membranes is equivalent to a bolt of lightning. And when you work out, we've got trillions of mitochondria. We just got a, a huge amount of energy that we need to um, provide to keep our living system working. And that huge amount of energy allows the brain and complex life to exist. The amount of energy per gene is is absolutely huge and it gives gives life living systems uh mammals in particular huge amounts of creativity to to develop and evolve uh, a brain our, our brain's about three times the size in number of neurons as the nearest primate we've got 86 billion neurons mm. uh the nearest primates have got i think uh, orangutans and gorillas about 30 billion neurons and all those neurons need to be powered yep to not just to provide those connections, those neural connections through synapses, but also to keep those neurons alive. And this is one of the problems that happens in Alzheimer's without sufficient energy to keep those neurons alive, they start to collapse in on themselves. And is that a mitochondrial issue? So for instance, with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and you know the fact that the neurons are not getting enough ATP, enough of the sort of energy currency, is that the main mechanism? Uh, that that is a that is a a big issue, yeah. and that like we see in Parkinson's that many people with Parkinson's have mitochondrial dysfunction, and in fact, the genes that are, are mutated in the familial forms so that's the that's the fami familial so that's running in the family rather than just being lifestyle factors. So uh, Parkinson's is about ninety five percent due to diet and lifestyle and about 5% familial. Wow. And those genes that in the familial forms of Parkinson's, those genes are mitochondrial quality control genes. Mm -hmm. So when mitochondria start to dysfunction, then the brain really, really struggles. All, all the, the ability to keep a, a cell intact, like there's the energy to pump nutrients, waste, waste materials out and get new nutrients in will be ATP and mitochondrial dependent. And the, the brain is, is almost entirely dependent on mitochondria for its energy. Interesting. So it, other parts of the body can work anaerobically, but... And what does that mean to work anaerobically, like yeah. without oxygen? Or? Without oxygen, yes. Yeah. So mitochondria, there's a, it's a term for, for working with oxygen. It involves mitochondria, and that's called oxidative phosphorylation for the people that are interested in that, that uh, kind of description. So your mitochondria let us work and provide energy with oxygen. Yeah. When mitochondria is switched off in terms of making energy, then we can work anaerobically and then make our ATP without oxygen. And that's great that li living systems like uh, a complex living system like us, our cells, have the ancestral memory of being both anaerobic without oxygen and with oxygen. Interesting. And so the oxidative phosphor uh, phosphorylation, phosphorylation. Yeah. so that is, in, in my understanding, is the ability that we have to oxidize the nutrients in our food, is that correct, to then be processed by the mitochondria to make ATP? Is yeah. that how it works? Yes, it is. And, and I, I really like thinking about going back to the source, that the energy that we get that mitochondria use it's sunlight. Yeah. So it's photons of sunlight are captured by plants. And then we either eat the plants or we eat the animals that have eaten the plants. And we slowly release the energy from sunlight into our mitochondria. And slowly, we do it slowly. And the, the important thing here is that we've evolved over a billion and a half years to be able to take that sunlight energy and make mini bolts of lightning in our cells. And we, we're virtually at capacity with that energy we produce. Okay. And if we start to eat a diet that's full of fast foods, simple carbohydrates, the energy that's released suddenly is way beyond what our cells and what mitochondria can cope with. Okay. And they start to make increasing amounts of reactive oxygen species or free radicals more than they can cope with. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. So what is it that causes dysfunction in the mitochondria? Because if I understand correctly, a lot of mental health issues, whether it's depression or neurodegenerative diseases, are caused by dysfunctional mitochondria. Yeah. So if I'm hearing you correctly, 
um, too much of a good thing. So they make ATP and energy, but, but if they make too much energy, that creates free radicals in the form of reactive oxygen species. Is that correct? If they're, if they're, if we're trying to force more energy onto them than they can cope with. Okay. They, Through rich food that's not necessarily... Simple, simple carbohydrates that produce a huge surge in blood sugar, then there's a problem. It's not, it's not just mitochondria. The cell itself can't cope with it either. They start to get overwhelmed and break down. And you may have heard of the term insulin resistance. Some biologists argue that insulin resistance may be a protective mechanism because the cell is so destroyed by excessive simple carbohydrates the insulin resistance may be a way of resisting the, the flood, or the onslaught of excess calories coming in. But insulin resistance then is a problem in itself. We see that in depression. We see that the, the hippocampus that's involved in depression, when that suffers from insulin resistance, and, and frustratingly, the hippocampus will rely on glucose to provide its energy so if we've been having a, a diet full of excessive glucose and it becomes insulin resistant, then the hippocampus will shrink just because it's getting too many simple carbohydrates. Interesting. So we can we can suffer from depression just by having the Western diet. It will inflame and it will cause insulin resistance. It will shrink the hippocampus. And I think it was the Whitehall study found because many people argue, that, well, I, I have lots of sugar because I feel down and I want to lift my spirits. Well, they found from the Whitehall study that just having the equivalent amount of sugar for five years of two cans of cola over five years. A that, day? Per day. Per day. Okay. Two, two cans, cans of cola per day, per day yeah. over five years. That on its own was enough to cause depression in significant amounts of people. Interesting. Well, I'm not surprised. Yeah. So the mechanism is basically the hippocampus shrinks because it's not getting enough glucose into its cells, which is essentially, uh, you know, which will produce the energy that the it's hippocampus It's also driving inflammation as well. And inflammation. So the inflammation will inhibit stem cell. So we, we have 700 stem cells in the hippocampus every day. Wow. And these stem cells should uh, be able, if they're left to their own devices to go from the stem cell through to adult hippocampal cell. So if we have too much stress, we have too much simple carbohydrates, we're not exercising, if we've got poor relationships, if we're not going outside, if we're overly stressed, these poor stem cells, these stem cells aren't able to make the transition to help keep our mental health yeah, because that was the other question also is, you know, what are the factors that then cause this inflammation and this lack of mitochondrial function, essentially? And I don't know the mechanism behind, you know, why does sugar cause inflammation? Why does stress cause inflammation? Like, do you, can you break down the mechanism? Because we know, for instance, you're right, that stress, simple carbohydrates, a lack of exercise, a lack of sleep, all these things can cause mm. inflammation. But what what is the mechanism? Mm. And then also once they've caused the inflammation, what is the mechanism that's destructive to the brain in that inflammation? Mm. Uh, and is it does it cause neuroinflammation sort of in the microglia, for instance, which yeah. are the inflammatory cells in the brain? Yes. So. Y y yes, all those things, yeah. So different there's there's different mechanisms for, for, for certain things, but stress is a major thing, but stress isn't all bad. Mm-hmm. So, so we, we've evolved from hunter gatherers. And so one of the theories of why we got such a, a large brain is because, uh, hunter gatherers, they, they came across novelty day in, day out and they're exercising. So the brain is sensitive to exercise, to improve the brain, to evolve the brain is also sensitive to novelty too. So mild stress is really, really good for the brain. Novelty means the brain will adapt and, and thrive in that mild stress. The problem comes is when that mild stress becomes chronic stress. The brain is not evolved for that at all. It's, this, it's evolved for novelty. It's evolved for actually enjoying that mild stress, getting a bit of a dopamine kick, getting a reward for that mild stress. 
Um, and, and that mild stress, I recently discovered this term in, in your book and in right. other places is hormesis, essentially, which is known as a sort of mild stress, which is healthy stress, yes. essentially. Yes. And it's when you tip from hormesis to chronic stress that you have problems, right? And one of the fascinating things also not to jump ahead was, was when you were talking about the fact that even the polyphenols, which are essentially in fruit and vegetables, yes. which are known as, you know, very good for you also cause mild hormesis so they're slightly toxic it's, it's it's a term so hormesis is a term that not that many people have heard of and it, it it really undermines a lot of this idea that everything's linear that you have everything that's all bad or all good and the fact that exercise is mildly toxic that fruits and vegetables are mildly toxic mm. stress is mildly toxic sea but we, air even yes yeah, sea yeah. air that the <laughs> the molecules by waterfalls by the sea the the tearing of water molecules produces free radicals which triggers our antioxidant system internally to evolve our system to make us stronger all these things the mild stresses are what's helped us evolve and if you think oxygen was a stress for many species billions of years ago and it killed and made extinct hundreds if not millions of species but we've evolved not only to take oxygen and deal with its toxicity, but to use it as a springboard to evolve. So there's there's this change in the way we see things. So so yes, we we need mild stresses, but the trouble is you can have too much of a good thing. You can overexercise, you can overeat uh, fruit and vegetable com compounds, and particularly if you have too many supplements, you can have too many of those. It's difficult to eat too many fruits and vegetables. Yeah, I was um, going to say. But, 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 but when, you take, when you take the concentrates, sometimes some people may react to them because you've got too many of those things. Yeah. And you can have too much stress, as we all know. Yes, that's for sure. Too um, much exercise. So with, with stress, mitochondria have receptors for cortisol, the stress hormone, and that will do good things to mitochondria, help them produce more ATP. They will thrive in small amounts of... Um, stress. But when it's chronic, they will then start just like simple carbohydrates. They will be pushed beyond what they can do. They will become dysfunctional. They will break down. They will drive inflammation and uh, trigger an, an immune response, which will then be harmful to the hippocampus. And so the, me so the mechanism, and that's very interesting. So the mechanism is basically that the cortisol receptors essentially burn out the mitochondria because uh, essentially they're having to produce too much energy. Is this how it works? Yeah. Too much ATP. And then the byproduct of that is, is the reactive oxygen species, which are destructive to the mitochondria. And, and, and mitochondria themselves, when they break down, they used to be bacteria. Uh -huh. They used to be bacteria, and when they break down and they're no, no longer making ATP, they become the immune system sees them as a threat. Ah, I so see. they're no longer making ATP; they're breaking down. And components they've got their own DNA, mm -hmm. and when mitochondrial DNA are outside of mitochondria, the cell says, "Hang on a second, this is a bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. We've got to fight this." So, for people that have suffered from chronic fatigue, one theory is there's a, a shift from uh, an infection that is a chronic infection which drives inflammation which damages the host and then the host the damaged tissue in the host is then driving the inflammation so interesting yeah. and so essentially under stress the dna leak out of the mitochondria and then the body thinks that this yeah. is an invader and mounts an inflammatory response, response. yeah and like, it, it, the trick is how do you, how do you step in and deal with that there's also another level to stress too which is uh, the vagus nerve yes. which is to do with the the relaxation part of the nervous system. So we're talking about the fight or flight part of the nervous system, which is good in healthy amounts, yeah. but we have to spend sufficient amounts of time in the rest and relaxation part. Mm. Uh, and this involves the parasympathetic nervous system. And when the vagus nerve is activated, and, and by the way, vagus means it, it, it's derived from vagabond, wanderer. Yeah because it wanders over the whole body. It's, it's what translates our life experience, what's happening outside us with people, with our environment. It translates that into signals within our body. And if it's, if it's positive, then it will heal our brain, it will heal our whole body. And these growth factors that are produced, which help protect our brain, start to go up. 
And when those growth factors like uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor go up, that draws mitochondria like magnets. They act like magnets to our synapses, pull mitochondria to, to those synapses and just produce more amounts of ATP. And even the mitochondria even become more efficient with these uh, neurotrophins like brain derived neurotrophic factor, they can make more ATP because they become more resilient as well. Well, it's interesting. I was going to ask you, in fact, about the relationship between the mitochondria and the brain derived neurotropic factor and the nerve growth factor. And yeah. so you're saying that essentially there's a sort of symbiotic relationship yeah, yeah, between absolutely. them. Yeah. So that when there's more BDNF or more in NGF nerve growth factor, that then the mitochondria rush to the synapses to produce more ATP and, yeah. and grow. So they work together. They all work together. Yeah. So. And with inflammation, these neurotrophins like brain-derived neurotrophic factor and nerve growth factor, with inflammation, they're suppressed. So uh -huh. you mentioned about the immune system in the brain, the microglia, when they're activated incorrectly, so that's the classic activation of microglia rather than the alternative one. The alternative one is driven by fruits and vegetables, by a healthy diet and lifestyle, which is protective to these growth factors and mitochondria, whereas the classic activated M1 microglial activation will drive mitochondria to start making reactive oxygen species rather than ATP. Okay. So, and, and this is what we see in aging and chronic stress. What we see in chronic disease is this shift towards chronic inflammation. And that was an interesting thing, in fact, was the two different modes of mitochondria. Because essentially, originally, a lot of us thought, okay, well, mitochondria, they produce energy. They produce ATP. That's what they do. They're the sort of batteries of our yeah. cells. They're the power packs that, that, you know, sort of power us on. But there's a whole other side to mitochondria, which is essentially they're sensing their environment and they're responding to their environment. And they can also not just produce energy, but if they're sensing stress or they're sensing sort of damage of some sort, cellular damage, for mm. instance, then they will switch to proliferation, growth, inflammation. Anabolism is called, yeah. Anabolism, exactly. So the energy production is called catabolism and the growth sort of mode is yeah. called an anabol an anabolism. Yeah, anabolic or catabolic. Anabolic yeah. or catabolic. And so this is really interesting because essentially it has two sort of now presumably both of these are desirable in the sense that one produces uh, energy the other produces growth and proliferation however the one that produces growth and proliferation there can be again too much of a good thing which yeah. is that it can produce too much growth pr too much proliferation yes. as in cancer for instance and also inflammation chronic inflammation can you talk us through these two different yeah sort of yeah it's, it's not it's not something that's well understood mm -hmm. and again diet and lifestyle have a profound influence on it but when we're talking about breaking down making ATP I mean I I like to have little, little hooks on trying to understand it uh, so catabolism it's like the same so cathode catholic it's like a conduit from god almost in a way that there's there's this conduit that breaks things down channels things down so that's that's kind of is it the entomology of a, of a word mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the idea there's this channel that breaks things down but anabolic is building up so your mitochondria they're known for making atp and that's what most people know them for but if there's excessive inflammation then they can switch. And it's not just excessive inflammation as say a fetus, for example, will be using an anabolic process to use mitochondria to help grow. Um, stem cells will be working in an anabolic way to help with their growth and maintain their metabolism. But when a neural stem cell has to move from being a stem cell to being a, a differentiated adult, adult neuron, it has to, in four days, it has to shift its metabolism from being anabolic to catabolic. And if it can't switch in four days, it will die. Really? So there has to be that switch from anabolic to catabolic in four days and it will die. So if there's too much inflammation, it can't make that transition. Oh. So it's really important to, 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 to help with that. So a lot of the components of mitochondria that are used in the process of making energy can be repurposed. So something like citric acid, so there's the cycle 
within mitochondria is sometimes known as the citric acid cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA. But most people know it as a Krebs Krebs cycle, cycle. Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. Mitochondria start to, rather than use that citric acid to help make ATP, goes through something called the electron transport chain, they start to export it. Mm. That then becomes the the raw materials to make saturated fat for cell membranes and cholesterol for cell membranes. So the the saturated fat within a lot of our cell membranes and the cholesterol comes from mitochondria. Interesting. So when there's inflammation, when and typically if we're eating a fast food diet, excess so the fast food diet will trigger cells to start exporting citric acid rather than burning it. There's too much energy. What are we going to do with it? It's going, it's going to overwhelm a cell. Yeah. It's going to overwhelm the cell. The cell's going to die. What what should it do? We've got to export that citric acid. It's too dangerous to, to leave it to kill a cell. We've got to export it and we've got to shunt it into adipose tissue, into fat, to try and preserve the organism. There's too much energy there. And so then it creates fat? Is that what happens? Yeah, then, then there'll be this adipogenesis. There'll be the production of fat. But then once the fat cells start to get these adipocytes start to get too much fat in them, they themselves start making hormones which are inflammatory, adipokines. Yeah. They're inf- inflammatory in themselves. And then we start to get all the things, the hormones related to satiety could become damaging themselves. So leptin, yeah. which should be helpful to us, people can become leptin resistant mm-hmm. and leptin can drive the immune system and drive autoimmunity. So the immune yeah. cells, are, yeah, they're so leptin essentially usually tells us that we've had enough to eat and mm. that we should stop eating. Yes. But what you're saying is that we develop, like we develop insulin resistance, yes. we develop Lept- leptin, leptin resistance, resistance yeah. which means that our cells don't recognize that we've got too much leptin and yeah. they're, they don't recognize the sy- signal for satiety. Mm. And so we yeah. continue eating even though we're not yes. necessarily, yeah. we don't need it. And that leptin then can drive inflammation in its own right. Further inflammation. There's, yeah. there's, there's so many different levels. And the, the immune cells themselves, they behave in different ways depending on the food we give them. So immune cells, they're normally in this uh, immunosurveillance mode. There's a few of them. They're like the, the watchmen or watchwomen. I don't know what you should say, but they're watching out for trouble. Yeah. And but the trouble... When when they sense the trouble, they move from being catabolic. Yeah. So re- energy producing. Energy production. Yeah. They've got they've got to make an army in a few seconds. How do they do that? They need raw materials to make that army to fight the infection. So where do they get the raw materials from? The mitochondria have to switch from making energy to making raw materials. So they become anaerobic. Uh, they become anabolic, and they have to rapidly. We have to make thousands of immune cells in a short space of time. So if we're eating a, a diet, the typical Rashtan diet, it's highly inflammatory, the food we eat will drive these immune cells to be moving towards inflammation. That's fascinating. And so not only will they be moving towards inflammation, but they'll be moving away from energy production, energy, yeah. which means that we'll f- probably feel more fatigued. Yes. And we won't have enough energy, it's essentially, to, yeah. to feel great and to feel good. So we'll be driven towards inflammation yeah. rather than towards energy production. Is that correct? That That's correct. And it goes on worse than that as it goes on. So we've only discovered in the last probably in the last 10, 15 years, that mitochondria, to be effective, have to eat themselves. Oh. They have to be digested. Autophagy, uh, is Mitophagy, that yeah. Mitophagy, <clears throat> yeah. yes. Mitophagy. There's uh, a guy, an American researcher called John Lamasters. He has oh, a lovely little story, and I, lo- I love these stories. It start, all starts on Easter Island, which is called Rapa Nui. If you, if you know it's called Rapa Nui, no, that's I the, didn't know that. It's called Rapa Nui. And in the 60s, some researchers discovered this or uh, this this it's chemical in the soil which was a, a mild antibiotic and they played around with it they brought it back and they found it was a mild antibiotic when they tried it on yeast they found that yeast lived much longer mm. i thought oh wow that's, that's interesting what's going on there well that should kill it it doesn't it makes it live longer and through that they f- they discovered these anti-aging genes they're called CERT proteins, S-I-R-T, CERT proteins, these anti-aging genes. And what the anti-aging genes did, they do lots of things, but one of the things they helped was to help make new mitochondria and to get rid of the ones that weren't working that well. 
And like in the liver, mitochondria will only last three to five days. In the brain, they might last 20 to 30 days in a neuron. So they have to be turned over. And the point I'm making here is obesity and insulin resistance will inhibit the ability for mitochondria to be going through quality control. They will get more and more inefficient. So not only we're not making enough energy, then the mitochondria involved in making energy get more and more fragile. They start making more reactive oxygen species, driving more inflammation, driving more shrinkage of the hippocampus. So you see all these different processes. They, they all build on each other until it gets really overwhelming. Yeah, this is fascinating. And so basically what happens in the brain is that the neurons, essentially the mitochondria, just don't they don't follow the healthy cycle. So the healthy cycle is that every few days they have to sort of auto commit suicide, essentially mitophagy. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's biogenesis um, to create new yes. new mitochondria, right? Yes. And this is a sort of quality control, as you call it. Yes. And essentially what you want is big, healthy mitochondria. But what happens is that this process gets damaged by insulin resistance or by inflammation. And then essentially, so these, these mitochondria don't die, but they sort of break down into smaller pieces. Is that yes. what happens? Yeah, yeah. So they get fragmented, they get more fragile, and then fragments of them essentially start to impact the other mitochondria? Is that is that what's happening? Yeah, they, through the whole process of quality control, they fuse together. So individual mitochondria and they fuse to make a bigger one, they break apart. And then as they break apart, the bits that don't work that well are digested and they join together. With insulin resistance and obesity by eating this typical Western diet and not exercising, the, the ability for mitochondria to join together to fuse gets undermined because they're all their mitochondria and these people that are obese and have insulin resistance they're fissioned they're small yeah making lots of reactive oxygen species and none of them are good enough to go through quality control and then they then produce lots of reactive oxygen species which then undermine other mitochondria undermine other neurons and when neurons don't have enough uh, energy, they start to collapse in on themselves. And that then creates neurodegeneration yeah. like Alzheimer's, yes. Parkinson's, yes. depression, uh, sort of mental yeah, health there's, issues. Yeah, there's, there's atrophy of the hippocampus when the hippocampus isn't getting enough energy and mitochondrial dysfunction in the hippocampus. Yeah, the, these processes are, are not something that happens purely in later life. Yeah. If someone's eating badly, they're getting this mitochondrial dysfunction throughout their lives. And I suppose... I mustn't just blame it on people eating badly. Yeah. Yeah, because there's many people that have had disadvantaged early life experiences. Many, many people come from, have been badly treated by either society or their parents, even like people that are lower, are perceived to be of, of lower status in society, a different color. All these people, if they sense that they're not viewed as highly as other people, they will get brain inflammation yeah. if, if they sense it. So the brain will inflame when if, if you don't feel you're a value to society, if you feel that somehow you're lesser than other people, their brain will inflame. And it's so important to treat people with kindness and not look down on people. Completely. And what is the mechanism behind that? Because that's fascinating. The fact that, you know, the perception of, you know, obviously stress, trauma, um, the perception of, of feeling that you're less important than someone else mm. or feeling that you're being picked on or victimized or whatever. What is the mechanism that drives that inflammation? It comes back to the vagus nerve again. And then we, we, we need to feel safe, particularly a child need to feel safe. Yeah. Um, need to feel engaged and connected, connected, and eye con Particularly, a, a child, a child needs to have the eye contact with a, a mother or a loved one to feel connected. You may have seen videos of a a child that where the mother looks away yes. and and doesn't hold that gaze, and a child within a few minutes is beside itself. Completely, it's yeah. so it's that engagement from the mother or a carer, just feeling part of a community and a value and that helps the nervous system to grow so that's the social engagement oxytocin is, is 
a big part of it. We used to think it was just about bonding with the mother and child, but now we know just friendships and social engagement can produce oxytocin, even looking into your pet dog's eyes or whatever animal that you have. Like when you look into a dog's eyes and it starts wagging its tail, it's producing oxytocin. It's getting brain derived neurotrophic factor and it's, it's getting a, a big boost of feeling good when you're connecting with it. So oxytocin, that will help with BDNF with the vagus nerve and that will send anti-inflammatory chemicals into the brain, brain derived neurotrophic factor and help your brain mitochondria. That's fascinating. And also, presumably, there's something to do with cortisol, which cortisol being the stress hormone can also drive inflammation if, if there's chronic stress. So yeah. that can drive, presumably, neuroinflammation. So if, you're, if you don't feel safe, yeah. then presumably that will cause sort of chronic cortisol, which could impact your brain. Yeah. And, and, it is, and we do see that, that if, if you've got the mild stress with dopamine, it's a challenge which you're, where you're thriving. The hormesis. You're, you're, actually, there can be a benefit particularly to stem cells, and the brain can be engaged and can thrive in that. But if there's not that dopamine, if you feel threatened with that cortisol, yeah. then that, that's when it's damaging. And um, yeah, we need to be able to engage the vagus nerve to be able to uh, move us back into parasympathetic nervous system activity. And I, I think many people in modern life forget how to engage that that parasympathetic nervous system via the vagus nerve and I, I mentioned things about uh, laughing crying singing dancing yoga meditation being with good people being in green spaces and i understand at the present time it's very difficult to have that social engagement that that many people thrive on and need i mean that must have done quite a lot of harm to people's mental health when they can't get close to the people that they desire to be with. It's, it's such a difficult time. It's such a difficult time with lockdown at the moment with COVID-19 and, you know, and, and it could go on for sort of indefinitely. We don't really know, you know, and you can't, I mean, hugging is a really important part of getting yeah. oxytocin and nobody can really hug at the moment. And mm. so it's quite a difficult situation. I agree with that. But so what are the, uh, in, in terms of the vagus, what is the relationship between the vagus and the mitochondria, if there is one, and also the vagus? And I, so the vagus is sort of the longest nerve that goes from the gut to the brain, essentially. Mm. And what is the relationship between the gut microbiota and the vagus and the mitochondria? Again, it's absolutely lovely that you, you're seeing this even in, in credible scientific journals, you're seeing about the mind, the, the, the gut gut brain axis like you can't believe it you'll see it in the lancet in nature you're seeing it in these in these journals it's becoming it's so, it's, so it's, it's really big yeah. um but what we what we do know is that the the gut microbiome microbiota they contain with them within them beneficial bacteria and the two most studied ones are the lactobacilli and bifidobacterium and they have the ability to change the way the nervous system works and they can work with through the enteric nervous system they can work through the vagus nerve and send signals up through the vagus nerve from the gut into the brain and they can help release acetylcholine or acetylcholine the neurotransmitter which will reduce inflammation in the brain it will help shift microglia into a protective form because microglia can be pathogenic or protective it helps shift them into the, their protective phenotype or or form and also it's really exciting that mitochondria have receptors for this acetyl or acetylcholine and that can help mitochondria work more efficiently too so the the the, the gut is so important in in brain health and we've found in studies that in animals i know it's quite cruel some of these animal studies but by blocking the bdnf being derived to the vagus nerve from the gut brain inflammation can be induced in these laboratory animals just by blocking this gut brain axis interesting by the vagus nerve yeah and so essentially the vagus nerve what you're saying you know mediates bdnf and also inflammation mm. is that how it works i mean yeah i mean we, we see this in parkinson's too that people with parkinson's frequently not everyone but they're seeing it more and more that people with parkinson's have had constipation for at least 10 years 
And there's a guy called, I think he's Dutch, Dr. Brack, B-R-A-A-K. He's tracked the inflammatory response in the gut over 10 years up through the vagus nerve. And then the inflammatory proteins can get into the substantia nigra of the person that then starts suffering from Parkinson's. So you can see not only a beneficial effect of connecting the gut and the brain, but a pathogenic connection between the gut and the brain. So if someone has constipation, just don't see it. So many people I speak to say, oh, that's just the way I am. Mm. It's not. It's not the way you are. Do everything you can. See a naturopath, see a nutritionist and work hard to get that gut working. That's one of the... It's not saying everyone that's constipated is going to suffer, but if you really want to lessen your chance of getting um, neuroinflammation and increasing the risk of uh, depression or neurodegeneration, then definitely look after your gut. Your gut. And the other thing is that the mitochondria are essential in the gut to produce energy, to keep the tight junctions, um, yeah. you know, so that there's no sort of intestinal permeability. Yes. And so the mitochondria need to be producing enough energy to make sure that the integrity of the gut lining is maintained. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Yeah. yeah that the, the, endothelial, Epithel- yeah. the endothelial cells within the gut, uh, but the Going beyond that, so there seems to be a correlation between the gut permeability and the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. Yes. So we've got a barrier between the brain likes to have its own metabolism and it likes to choose what it lets come in and out. Yeah. And under stress and inflammation, mitochondria within the blood-brain barrier become compromised too. And so that allows the the gut, the blood-brain barrier to become more leaky. That allows more immune cells to go through. That allows more toxins to go through that it wouldn't choose. Even cholesterol metabolites going through can be inflammatory to the brain. The brain has its own cholesterol metabolism. It's different from the rest of the body. It doesn't like cholesterol metabolites from the peripheral circulation. The it likes to. Ha- it has its own metabolites. That's fascinating. So we need to have mitochondria to have enough energy to keep that integrity and and one of the biggest worries is things like heavy metals like aluminium aluminium is a a, is a huge toxin to the blood brain barrier uh, and can cause that leaky blood brain barrier one thing that can benefit the blood brain barrier and some people can tolerate it and some can't is is caffeine and this is always uh, seem people go like this caffeine but caffeine's bad for me but caffeine can improve the integrity of the blood brain barrier really that Caffeine is a, it's, it's a kind of chemical called a methylxanthin, and it's, it's got a similarity to some of our purines that we use for communication outside of cells. It's purines are used within DNA and RNA, but uh, they're also communicators and allow us, it allows mitochondria to, to communicate to DNA as well. They're just wonderful. But um, when the communication is wrong for the blood-brain barrier, it can become leakier, and caffeine interferes with that communication and tightens the blood-brain barrier and can lessen inflammation in the brain. So for people that can tolerate caffeine, there's much less risk of depression for people that drink coffee, much less risk of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and, and even suicide risk as well. Really? Um, the, the brain... It's not saying everyone, obviously, but be careful that it's not it's not negating any psychological issues, but usually psychological and biological issues are going hand in hand. And really, if you can deal with some of the biological issues, then I think you've got more of a chance uh, getting to grips with, with the psychological stuff. side of stuff. Agreed. But what about the effects of caffeine on the adrenals? I mean, you know, and, and sort of burning out, sort of, you know, having excessive uh, influence on your cortisol, for instance. Yeah, that's that's always that's always a problem. So I generally say, I mean, and some people can't deal with caffeine at all, and they, they haven't got the genetics to deal with it. It just sends them a bit climbing the walls. They can't break it down. But if you are going to have caffeine, then... It's, it's it's using it in a social situation, mm. using it when you're more in this parasympathetic side of your nervous system, that you're with people, you're in a yeah, a social situation where oxytocin and, and everything is is calming the nervous system down. But if you're using caffeine because you haven't got time for lunch, you've got to get to work, you've got to get to there and get to there and pick the That's kids up great. and then you've got a coffee and you're using it to drive fight or flight. Yeah then that's really unwise because you 
you're driving the cortisol even higher. So it's just being wise how you use that caffeine. How you use it. Okay, that's fantastic. This is so interesting. So I just want to break it down now to the, the things that are really going to damage your mitochondria. So you've mentioned a few things. So you've mentioned a sort of Western diet, which is very high in refined carbohydrates, such as sugars and white flours. You mm. want to avoid those as much as possible. You've also mentioned a sort of lack of exercise, lack of sleep, stress, lack of connection. Are there other things, toxins you've also mentioned, sort mm. of heavy metals? Are there other things that will essentially damage the mitochondria and, and drive inflammation and, and that you can think of that we can list? I mean, it's great that the gut-brain axis is becoming, becoming more aware of the microbiome and the damage that occurs to the microbiome when the microbiota, when we have antibiotics. And, and one of the things that, it's, it's that the loss of vitamin K is, is quite catastrophic because bacteria can produce vitamin K as well. And we're finding that like, vitamin K is anti-inflammatory, particularly people with multiple sclerosis, that the myelin sheath can be protected by vitamin K. And that, that's really exciting that the, the, the oligodendrocytes that, that help provide the myelin, vitamin K can be really supportive for those. And vitamin K is in green leafy vegetables. Green leafy vegetables, mainly. yeah. And yeah. It, so by eating more pasture-fed foods, so if we if we eat more food, so we if we eat the animals that have been fed on pastures or we eat dairy products where they've been pasture fed, that's going to have more grass, which has more vitamin K, so they'll have more more vitamin K as well. So, make making sure that we uh, are not just avoiding the Western diet, but we're making choices, wise choices, to uh, eat good foods, and then not just eat good foods. It's not about uh, eating things because they're on a list. It's trying to do it in a way, and I, I mentioned in the Mediterranean diet, mm. is not. it's defined by UNESCO, the United Nations group. It's defined by them as not just the foods, all the wonderful foods that I have within it, and extra virgin olive oil is wonderful for, for the brain. It's also preparation. It's also eating together. It's eating slowly. So you're engaging the parasympathetic nervous system so you can digest the food. Yeah. If you're eating on the run, if you're eating all the best food, yeah. but you're eating on the run and you're all eating, watching TV or, or doing things in different places in the house, then even if you're eating good food, that's probably still not going to be integrated and and helped. Absolutely. Okay, so that's great. And then, um, so antibiotics, you know, essentially the mitochondria are bacteria. And so anything that harms bacteria, antibiotics can be harmful to, well, are harmful to bacteria. Mm. So they are harmful to our mitochondria is my understanding in pesticides. Yes. And so these types of, you know, in the pesticides that we find in non-organic foods, the glyphosates, etc., these can be damaging to our mitochondria. They, they can, yeah. And so that's a huge problem, I think, given it, how it prevalent. Mm. Yeah. If if we're healthy, and then so like the liver needs mitochondria to be able to break down a lot of these toxins. If we're healthy, then healthy people can generally clear these things quite well. But when someone's unhealthy, then it becomes more and more difficult because the mitochondria can't work that well. And then the pesticides start damaging mitochondria and it's a bit of a downward spiral. And if you think about it, pesticides are designed to undermine the metabolism of uh, pests. Uh, yeah. They're designed to destroy their mitochondria. Yeah. Design, but we hope that they will be killed before we are. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's the kind of premise that, that we're strong enough. But Generally, if you're healthy, it's okay. But there's also, I mean, it, it's only a couple of years ago that we got rid of an organic pesticide called rotenone. Mm. So rotenone was an organic, used by organic farmers. We couldn't, couldn't really find out how much it was used. Interesting. But that is a heavy mitochondrial toxin. And that's used in organic farming. That was farming. used until wow. a couple of years ago in organic farming. And mm. some of the mainstream farmers that used the chemical pesticides were up in arms they said well we're really regulated about the way we use our pesticides and we make sure there's only trace amounts but the rotenone was unregulated it, you use it if you have to but not too much not too much not too little that wasn't really regulated that well so it's never it's never straightforward no. it's never straightforward but but yes you're right 
pesticides can be really damaging to mitochondria. And the other fascinating thing is what what I learned was, you know, things like overeating, so too high calorie intake, so eating too much um, and eating too often. So snacking or eating throughout the day for long periods of time can also put a strain on your mitochondria because every time you're eating, they're being asked to essentially Mm. metabolize what you're eating and provide energy to digest your food, etc., and that can put a strain on on is is that how does that mechanism yeah work? i mean I, I, the way i see it is that what we, what we talked about if they're overwhelmed with too many calories that the the amount of energy the amount of sunlight energy that's being produced through the photons that are held in so there's something called nadh yeah which glucose gets converted the energy in glucose gets put into something called nadh and that in excess, delivering too much of that to mitochondria is a problem. There's too much sunlight energy and it literally burns mitochondria. But if we're snacking too often, then that's a problem that there's, that we're never allowing insulin levels to, to, to drop. And then this whole process of mitochondrial renewal, of mitophagy, of, of quality control, the insulin levels never drop sufficiently to allow this quality control to kick in. Okay. So we, and, and some people, there's a, a guy in America, Dr. Dale Bredston, mm. he talks about just, he's working with Alzheimer's and dementia. He talks about to, if possible, eat as early as possible in the evening, say eat six o'clock and then sort of eat a bit, don't, don't eat too late for your evening meal and too early for breakfast, just to allow that time for fasting overnight not everyone can do that because you've got insulin resistance some people might not be able to do that you might need to sort out the diet first but yeah so that time to allow insulin to drop to allow a little bit of fasting to allow this renewal process to go on will regenerate mitochondria Well, that's a really interesting point because that was leading me to my next point, which is, you know, what can we do to support our mitochondria? And I know that fasting or intermittent fasting is one of the things that can Mm. actually help our mitochondria. And again, I think back to hormesis, sort of the the mild stress of fasting can be very regenerative to our mitochondria. Explain the function. Yeah. So, or is it about insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity? One of the things that the so I mentioned these uh, anti-aging proteins, these SERP proteins. Yeah. So one of the main mechanisms, and so it's about depletion of energy. But so ATP, when it when it drops in level, the body goes into it's a bit of a crisis, really. Yeah. So there's not enough energy coming in. What what shall we do? Uh, so what the body does? Okay, I'm going to go on an efficiency drive. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start seeking out all these things that aren't working that well and break them down and use them as a fuel source. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, I haven't got enough energy, so I'm going to improve the efficiency of mitochondria. I'm going to have mitochondrial biogenesis. I'm going to have more mitochondria. I'm going to have um, better quality, better quality yeah. organelles and, and cells. And so it's, it's, it's so in this energy crisis, it starts to break down fat. It starts, and some people go as far as ketosis, which is the breakdown of fat to make, these fat metabolites called ketones, and they can be healing to mitochondria too. The difficulty is if someone's chronically unwell, they might not be able to engage in these processes. Also, if you're eating a a ketogenic diet, many people will start to eat alone and they may not be eating together. They may be so obsessed with a ketogenic diet that they're eating alone and they're not getting the benefit. They're so I'm doing this diet and the rest of the family is eating something else. They're withdrawing from that. And so they're losing the oxytocin. They're losing that connection from family. So that's that's difficult. That's so interesting because, of course, the ketogenic diet, I was going to ask you about that because, I mean, ketones are essentially can be quite healing to the brain. And the brain often prefers ketones as fuel than Mm. they do that, you know, works better on ketones, especially Mm. the aging brain as opposed to working on glucose. That's Mm. my understanding. And in fact, in neurodegenerative diseases, and you mentioned Del Bredesen, but I mean, he, uh, you know, advocates 
uh, fat for fuel as opposed to glucose for fuel for brain cells because yeah. the aging brain, first of all, it increases insulin sensitivity and also it's a better source of more usable fuel for the brain. But I'd never thought of that side of sort of the, the antisocial element of the ketogenic diet. Yeah, it, it'd have to be something that you do as a group rather than individually. And some people just can't cope with too much saturated fat. When mitochondria are dysfunctional, mm. they cannot break down saturated fat. There's something called beta oxidation within mitochondria. And when mitochondria become dysfunctional, they really struggle, particularly long chain saturated fats. They really struggle. And we see this particularly in multiple sclerosis, where many people struggle to break down fat. And this poorly metabolized fat can get into the myelin sheath and damage the myelin sheath. Some people with MS, they seem to be okay in a ketogenic diet. But there's a, there's a, so Terry, you might have heard of Terry Wall. Yep. She, she is a proponent of the ketogenic diet or the pe uh, paleo diet. There's other people that have found that the high saturated fat can be undermining for people with MS. And so they suggest a low saturated fat diet and many people thrive on a low saturated fat diet and the studies are now coming up showing that this inability to deal with saturated fat is a problem for some people because of mitochondrial dysfunction because of mitochondrial dysfunction the mitochond mitochondria cannot break down that saturated fat and some people with inflammation that saturated fat could also get into immune system receptors like toll like receptors and that might make them more inflammatory too. So healthy people, saturated fat doesn't seem to be much of a problem. But when you get to different health conditions, then that saturated fat, particularly if it's long chain, like 16 carbons, palmitic acid is the, is the one that's the, the real big one. And what is that found in, palmitic acid? It's found in mainly animal foods, but it is found in palm oil, it's found in, in small amounts in coconut oil. The shorter chain saturated fats tend to be really protective. So the medium chain triglycerides tend to be really protective. So they're, they're much more healthy. And so if a, I'd say if a person is involved in a ketogenic diet and they're trying to heal a neurodegenerative condition or try and support it, I prefer to go for the shorter chains and perhaps go for more olive oil and more vegetable, less omega-6, more omega-3 and more monounsaturated rather than long chain. So I want to get to what we can do really to help our mitochondria. So mm. what, what can we do to help our mental health first and foremost mm. by helping our mitochondria? How can we increase our energy in our brain essentially? Mm. How can we increase our, you know, um, sort of neuro regeneration of the brain? Mm. How can we increase the resilience of our brain, uh, the size of our hippocampus and the functionality of of our mitochondria and how can we increase their energy production? So I know those are a lot of different yes. things, but what are sort of the top 10 tips to do the, that? The big one is the Western diet. Mm -hmm. That's the big one, first of all. The Western diet, the just simple carbs, that, that simple carbs. And, and if, if someone's eating lots of simple carbs, fast food, then they're not eating all those fresh fruits and vegetables. And these are things like white bread and pasta yeah. and, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, so not complex carbohydrates, <clears throat> but yeah. sugars, simple carbs. So avoid simple carbs completely, I would think. Yes, avoid, avoid simple carbs. And the next thing is stress. Yeah. Particularly if, and I know I was like it, that I was kind of brought up in a family where normality was being stressed. Mm. My mum was just a stress ball and and I assumed that was the way life that was, was. and it took me a long it took me to get to burnout before I realized there was a different way and I still have perhaps a tendency to to move into to that situation so dealing with stress making sure it's not saying stress is completely bad saying that you need novelty you need to have challenges but you also need to have time out. You need to relax. So that's really important. That will regenerate the brain. Plenty of fruits and vegetables. They're regenerative. They will help reduce inflammation in the brain. Exercise. Exercise. Yeah, exercise. I, I talked about the yeah the hunter gatherers. The exercise was something that helped us evolve to get a bigger brain because 
the more we exercise, the more novelty we had, the, the more the brain evolved. And that's one of the theories about why we got such a large brain. And social circle is, a, is another one which they think may have driven the size of the brain too. The larger the social circle in primates particularly, the more you need to have memory of all the different people that are in your social circle. Oh. Um, even telling white lies requires a bigger brain because you have to remember that, that, <laughs> that you've told all the... So being diplomatic is is something that you need to remember how these untruths you told people. But if you told people to their face what you thought of them, you wouldn't have many friends, would you? No. So you have to be diplomatic. So that, that's important to have a, a social circle if you can. In terms of foods, I really like that. We, we mentioned vitamin K to protect mitochondria. We know that vitamin K supports mitochondria too. Green leafy vegetables. Yeah, green, green leafy vegetables. They, what about people who are on warfarin? So, for instance, you know, warfarin being a blood thinner is an anti-vitamin K drug. Mm. What would you say to them? Because they have to take their warfarin to thin their blood, but they do that by essentially getting rid of the vitamin K, which, you know, so it's a vicious circle. It's difficult. There are other blood thinners, blood thinners which are less sensitive. And I've seen that, I mean, everything would have to be done with the permission of, of the, the medical um, with with the medical profession, yes, but I think the less the other medication is less sensitive to vitamin K, so I think that's a really important discussion that needs to be had. You, what about ubiquinol? So co Q ten because that's a very important um, supplement essentially in the whole mitochondrial um, process. And one of the issues is statins, which are a very common yes. anti cholesterol mm -hmm. drug one of the most common, essentially hamper the sort of CoQ10 uh, genesis. And, 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 and so what we have to do is to take supplement with CoQ10 in one form or another. I guess it's ubiquinol is probably the better form of CoQ10 to supplement with. I don't know. You'll, you'll tell me. But if you're on statins in particular, because the statins can harm the mitochondria, mm. I think. Can you explain a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah. Ubiquinol is, is a very difficult one because, yeah, there's ubiquinol or ubiquinone. Mm. Ubiquinol is the considered to be the more active form. The difficulty there is that we only absorb 3% across the gut wall uh -huh. and even less into mitochondria. So only a tiny fraction of ubiquinol or ubiquinone gets into mitochondria. So yes, I would suggest supplementing ubiquinol or ubiquinone, but I'd also look at supporting uh, ubiquinol or ubiquinone with other quinones such as vitamin K, which is phylloquinone or menoquinone, that's vitamin K, that supports ubiquinol. Also, um, we have plastoquinone, so green leafy vegetables. They have within them uh, a cousin of mitochondria called uh, plastoquinone. So a plastoquinone is within chloroplasts of, of green, green plants. And so by eating plants that are rich in mitochondrial cousins, mm. we're getting some of the antioxidants like plastoquinones, which can support CoQ10. Mm. So that, that's really important to up our green leafy vegetables to support our mitochondria with their, with their cousins. I, I quite like that idea. That's a great idea. And, and, and just be, it's great to have CoQ10, but it is really, really difficult to absorb. And for people to get benefit in Parkinson's, they have to be eating a so perhaps a, like a gram of CoQ10 to get any notable benefit because so little gets absorbed. It's, it's useful as an antioxidant outside the cell. Yeah. So there's no harm in that. It's a fat soluble antioxidant. But to really help mitochondria, we kind of have to think a bit laterally to, to get things that are related to CoQ10 to, to support it. Okay. And what about other um, sort of antioxidants or vitamin things like you know, vitamin D, magnesium, zinc, omega-3s, resveratrol, you know, curcumin. I mean, there are quite a few in your books yes. um, in terms of boosting mitochondrial function. Are mm. there any, what, what would be your sort of top three or four, I, I guess, apart from vitamin K, you know, is it B vitamins, E's, A's? Yes, it's, it's all a bit of a minefield. It I is, think that right? the best thing, though, to start off with is, is diet, making sure... I don't think you can take supplements without making sure that the, the diet is is uh, is there. So there's no point 
trying to improve mitochondria when the diet is not not there. Mm. But so improve the diet, and then we can then start to supplement, making sure yeah omega threes that reduces inflammation, that supports mitochondria, that helps mitochondria move out of inflammation more into making energy. Same with uh, curcumin and, and resveratrol. They will also push hormesis. And some people will have a, a limit to the amount of these polyphenols from fruits and vegetables. Some people have a limit to what they can cope with. So what we do know is it's not the amount of these polyphenols that, that are important. It's the it's the variety of them. Oh. So, And we see this with people with chronic disease. If, if they eat a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, like have 10 a day, particularly for mental health, if you're having 10 a day of fruit and vegetables, that is far more beneficial than just taking a huge amount of one of them or just four of them. Interesting. So eat widely. You can eat small amounts, but eat widely so you get different polyphenols, you get different plant compounds. That's fascinating. Taurine I find really helpful, alpha-lipoic acid. In, in fact, alpha-lipoic acid is, is, is kind of like a B vitamin which supports energy production, but that also pushes hormesis as well, mm. uh, and that's really helpful. One other thing we haven't really discussed is sleep. So I know that sleep and circadian rhythms are also very important for mitochondria. And, you know, melatonin apparently protects mitochondria. And I think there's a big problem with the fact that we're getting, you know, we have a disruption in our sort of circadian rhythms due yes. to our late nights and uh, sort of blue light and screens, etc. So can you talk a bit about sleep and, and circadian rhythms and blue light and melatonin in terms of protecting our mitochondria? There's some researchers that, and this has been disputed by some people, but, but they claim that it's true that mitochondria, when we, when we eat lots of green vegetables and we've got lots of chloroplasts, that the, they may be helped to make ATP by being exposed to, to light. So... That's a bit different from what you're saying, but there's, there's there's some research pointing out to the fact that if you're eating more green vegetables, you might be able to make ATP because you're you're photosynthesizing a little bit from the, the green vegetables. It sounds a bit far out there, but there's a study pointing it out. Well, that's fascinating, <clears throat> and also you know the fact that red light and different different, different light wavelengths. waves yeah. can actually boost your mitochondria. So, for yeah. instance, I have this near and far infrared yeah. um, sort of light system, which apparently help boost the mitochondria. Yeah, uh, I've I've had a client with with Parkinson's that that did a lot of therapy with near and far light infrared and and they didn't get any benefit they i think their mitochondria may have been so dysfunctional that, that it seemed could it seemed to make them worse really it seemed to make them worse yeah and maybe because of the hormesis the fact that basically it stresses them a little bit i think if if you if your mitochondria are on a knife edge yeah then there's there's it's too much it's very little that's needed to push them over the edge in terms of sleep yes yeah, circadian rhythm rhythms we know that there's this uh, jet lag effect. If people, if people are not following their circadian rhythms, they start to feel as if they've been traveling through time zones. What you call social jet social lag. Social jet lag, mm. yeah, that's the term. That they're, they're not able to engage in the natural rhythms and they're moving out of that and they'll get exhausted. And then what do they do? They sleep in later and later and later. Mm. And then they get more and more exhausted. Yeah. So that that's really difficult. There's another thing called the glymphatic system. Mm -hmm. And we see this in, in depression, that the ability to move waste material, get nutrients into the brain and waste material out, that occurs mainly in sleep. It happens mm -hmm. in exercise too. So if the hippocampus is not able to get nutrients in, it's not able to get waste materials out, either through exercise or the right kind of sleep, then that's going to be a problem as well. Understood. And then one other thing in terms of hormesis is sort of hot cold therapy. And a lot of people, you know, swear by either yes. infrared saunas or saunas mm. that really heat up your cells and yes. create slight stress in these cells, which apparently boosts the mitochondria. Or, you know, people like Wim Hof who advocate sort of really cold. cold. Yeah. yeah. And do you know what, what's the potential mechanical effect on mitochondria? With the heat... Um, there's these proteins called heat shock proteins yeah. and been looking at this in Parkinson's as well. So if you think proteins need a certain shape to, to have an effect and um, when we heat an egg, 
it goes from being clear to being white. And that's because the proteins have got all jumbled up and no longer pass light through. And the same happens if we get too hot, we can literally fry the proteins in our brain. So we make these things called heat shock proteins, which not only protect our brain, but then we make them just like hormesis, they become protective to the brain. So they do more than just come in and save us. They come in and repair damage too. And uh, there's been a, a study looking at that in Parkinson's and in the Pepsi dish. They've used these heat shock proteins to help heal some of these damaged proteins in the Petri dish. And it's like unfrying an egg effectively by putting them in. You, it kind of remakes the proteins in, a, in an un, un, um, tangled way. So that's the kind of the heat side of stuff. On the other side, the cold. I know there's a link with, again with the vagal nerve. Mm. That the, and I've, I've got a, a friend who has rheumatoid arthritis and uses, gets in the sea to push her vagal nerve into making a lot of anti-inflammatory compounds. And that is something that really deals with the rheumatoid arthritis every, every day. So every day the rheumatoid arthritis is manageable if she swims in the ice cold sea. And that seems to push the parasympathetic nervous system to calm everything down within the immune system. Wow, that's amazing. And essentially, so that through the vagus nerve going into parasympathetic, it then creates a sort of anti-inflammatory An anti-inflammatory effect, effect in, that, in the brain and or that, uh, throughout, throughout the body, throughout the I think, body. throughout the body. That seems to be the effect that, that's going on with her. One of the biggest things, though, is, and I, I don't know if you heard of Joseph Campbell. Have you, have you heard of Joseph Campbell? I've heard of them, yeah. I know it sounds a bit trite but he says follow your bliss mm. so the the whole body is geared up to providing energy to the brain and to the body when we're inspired so if we can do anything we can to try not to feel like we're doing things out of duty mm. but because we're inspired to do it I know it's incredibly difficult for some people because of the situation they're in but if you can find something that inspires you that you feel you've got a certain amount of autonomy that you feel that you're a master of your destiny in some area then that is really beneficial for the brain really beneficial that the brain tends to regulate the amount of energy it gets depending on how it thinks that it's needed and if it's if you feel that what you're doing is not worthwhile the brain will not give you the energy for it. Interesting. So essentially your ATP and your neurons will adapt to what you're, essentially what you're sort of, you know, how inspired you are or how much you, you're, you have a sense of purpose, presumably, yeah. and mission. And, yeah. Yeah. This and so, I mean, for some people that could just be getting, I talked about pets before, if it's possible to get something like a pet you can walk a dog and then you've got the oxytocin and you've got all that connection but it's making those connections and people make connections in different ways so connect 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 whether it's the countryside or whether it's people or whether it's a project but something that you feel that you can put your passion into then the brain will respond i know if you've got chronic health issues it might be difficult but that's that's the way the brain deals with energy production. So you get excited about something, you connect with something, and that basically mm. boosts your yeah. mitochondria in your brain. To but not too much. Energy. I mean, you can get obsessed. I mean, I see so many people that get onto a project and they don't sleep for a couple of days and then they crash. Yes. It's not It's not the just do something, crash, do something, crash. Yeah. It's, it's this thing where this project will just continually build you and you'll feel stronger and stronger and more empowered and inspired but you don't crash it's it's something that that is building you all the time day in day out and nourishes you well that's a wonderful beautiful place place to to end on i must say because that's very i think you're absolutely right and we focus so much on the biochemistry and the you know all these sort of chemical reactions mm. but ultimately what really causes these chemical reactions is our mindset and mm. the way we choose to live and the way we relate to other people yeah so I'm very grateful to you, you, Ray Griffiths. You've been fantastic, and thank you so much. And I highly recommend your <laughs> wonderful books. And thank you for coming on the Mind Health 360 show. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that your mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you may take to start your healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful. And if you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or check us out on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program. Thank you.